Uh, and thank you everyone for the invitation to come along today and speak about East Lomond. Um, this is going to be in two parts. I've got the task of trying to synthesise the excavations that were led by uh, my friend and colleague, Dr Oliver Brady, um, which has now been built upon by and the team at Aberdeen University. So I'm going to try and synthesise those early excavations. I'm going to do that by trying to extract some of the highlights. Uh, so some of the slides you may have seen before, uh, because East Lomond has been like a fairly regular feature over the last nine years excavating uh, there at the, the TAFAC conference. So I'm going to start just by uh, looking at these two stones, which was one of our first indications that uh, the pigs were present at East Lomond. These are monumental stones, they're pretty large stones. Uh, they're currently in Falkland Palace there, but you have the um, classic Pictish symbols, uh, which are found all over the east and north of Scotland. And these were found in a byre uh, in a farm on the Falkland estate, which is where East Lomond is situated, uh, when the byre was being demolished in the 1970s. But moving on, um, we wouldn't be talking about any of this if it wasn't for Oliver's investigative noose and his knowledge and his leadership um, at East Lomond. And I particularly like this image. This is an image, and there's some other people's faces that you may recognise here, taken down in London when, or just before we met with Alice Roberts for the Digging for Britain programme, looking at East Lomond. And for those who haven't seen it, it's series six, episode three, North, where we are in a great company of Iona, and Vindolanda and other iconic places. Richard said this morning Oliver was interested in places that matter, and East Lomond is one of these places that matter, and I'm hoping to be able to show you that uh, today. This is the very base of the hill, which is uh, a volcanic plug. And you can actually look, you can see close to the pyroclastic flow here, and the red lines delineate where, where we believe outer annex of the fort is. And the main hill fort up here, the, the scheduled monument, we haven't been in yet. We've been excavating in this outer area here. It was described in 1857 by an antiquarian as a ravelin, which would not disgrace a modern engineer. And he was referring to this dog leg outer bank and ditch fortification uh, on the southern edge of the hill. Our first indications from 2014 um, this was the evidence from that single excavation. Everything was pointing to a high status site uh, on East Lomond. And I know there are a number of people in the audience here that I can see who have been party to the excavations uh, on East Lomond and who have participated um, as, as volunteers. Everything was pointing to a high status site. But why is the archaeology so good? And I'm going to show you some of the so good archaeology. Well, this is the 1695 Division of Commentaries Act from the Scottish Parliament. And I'll let you read some of the archaic language. But basically, it says that the commentaries, where people can graze their cattle and their sheep or whatever, can be divided. And they were divided across all of the loans of Scotland. If you were a landowner or a house owner, you were allocated a piece of land. Except the commentaries belonging to the king and the royal boroughs. And Falkland, of course, as a royal estate. It's a 4,000 acre estate and it was the hunting estate of the Stuart Kings. And we have evidence and we have records in the palace at Falkland of deer being hunted on the Falkland estate, being sent to Linlithgow, being sent to Edinburgh Castle, being sent to Stirling Castle and elsewhere. So James IV, fifth Mary Queen of Scots, they were all present there. And Marie de Guise, who brought the French stone missions over to, uh, to Fife, transformed it from a Scottish castle, a very male environment, into Scotland's first Renaissance palace, a much more family-friendly environment. But for 120 years, the destruction that happened in the lowlands, where things were made into straight lines and measured out and allocated, did not happen on the Falkland Estate. Other evidence of that, and this is not just a nice picture, you can see here, this is a bit of, of LiDAR imagery, you can see the later on square allocations of space to people, but we also have on the estate the ancient curvilinear boundaries, which predate 1695, not straight and protected. And if you look closely, you can see 
that there's possibly some very interesting archaeology under that. So it's a landscape which has been preserved to a degree and protected to a degree from the depredations of the clearances or the improvement programme in 1695. Now remember 1695 is that decade of the 1690s where Scotland suffered successive crop failures. The seven ill years uh, is what it's called. And where Scotland lost approximately 15% of its population through starvation. So this is about the period of improving the viability of the land in Scotland. Uh, and it happened across the lowland. It didn't happen so much here. And it didn't happen for 120 years until 1815. And here's a report to a national body. And it's uh, under Sir John Sinclair. And he talks specifically about the Lomond Hills in the county of Fife and how far behind the rest of the country it is. And he makes certain recommendations about how it could be improved. They started then to allocate, and I've seen the maps, and it's to general this and colonel that and various bits of landed gentry. And in 1818, uh, they began to divvy up the estate, but no one really went up to this upland area to develop farms. One or two tried, didn't work. And by 1821, um, uh, Dr. David Bruce begins to buy up uh, all this estate uh, and make it what it became today. Another highlight, some of our early uh, charcoal uh, dates. Um, we have everything from the 1st to the 7th century AD. The 52 AD uh, date comes from somewhere on the extreme left of the hill that we've never been back to. That for, and it was behind a, a raised bank of that period. But this is some of the early work that Oliver uh, was responsible for, um, which gave us some hope that we had something which was really long lived and long used. Some further examples of or highlights of the past excavations, a set of hearths. And if you look closely at this picture, you'll see one, two, three, four. There are five stacked hearths here. And there are more hearths underneath because we didn't get to the bottom. This is in 2017. And that's quite rare when you're looking at the top of a, of a hill fort in Scotland. So it's a rich landscape, and I'm sure James is going to say some more about Haas more recently. We also have evidence of contact with Rome, lovely Roman melon bead, fragment of Roman glass bangle, and Roman pottery, very typical of the kind of diplomatic gift giving from the Romans to tribes north uh, of the border. Feasting and drinking ware, things that cement alliances, and it is one of the big questions for us about how the people in Fife related to Rome. And we're beginning to get a picture uh, of that. And there are several collaborators that we talk to that help us to inform uh, what our thinking is, including Fraser Hunter, who identified at the National Museum. But it's not all Roman. It's not all Roman. This here is a lovely rosette-headed brooch. And somebody, was it Cathy this morning, had a couple of similar brooches. And I wonder if it's going to be the same as this. This was excavated from uh, East Lomond in 17. It's copper alloy, and it's been tinned to make it look like silver. But it's native production. And Oliver's research brought us to Professor Curl in the 1920s at Traprain Law, where he identified the moulds for this particular kind of brooch. So this is manufactured in the east of Scotland, and we find one at East Lomond. So there's the East Lomond, the big red dot. Where else do you find these pins? Well, there's one up at Cove Sea, part of this votive deposit away up north. Then there's Traprain itself. And then there's no others in the British Isles, except down here. And we wondered why are these brooches, which are manufactured in the east of Scotland, found nowhere else except down in this part of the world here? And we think we have the answer, using, as Richard would say, disciplines, when we look at Rome, and we look at Ptolemy's map of 150 AD, as well as seeing the Venicones, as he described the people in Fife, we see Isca Silurum, the Second Augusta Legion. And the Second Augusta Legion built the easternmost part of the Antonine Wall. And in the Hunterian Museum, Glasgow, you'll see the Bridgeness Stone, which dedicated to Antoninus Pius. And we also know that they built Carpau in the north of Fife during the Severan campaign, which is a 30 hectare supply base. So the men of the Second Augusta Legion 
based here, certainly new fife in that 50, 60 year period of the Roman Empire that we're talking about. And the supposition is that they either bought these to take home to their families, or they married local women and went back down with them, or they took slaves down with them. But somehow, these brooches manufactured here in the east of Scotland find their way down to here in South Wales. And we think the Second Augusta Legion is the link that brings them together. Something else that Oliver and I have talked about, and we've talked about with various people, you can see these Roman marching camps going up the way to the north. And yes, they are glen blockers, but I think there's something else where you look to the west, because they're actually protecting the most fertile parts of Scotland, the East Lothian, Fife, Angus, and up there. And Fife in particular is a peninsula, and I think that is significant. I'll come back to that. So in 2019, before I hand over to James very shortly, this is what we were able to say following Oliver's excavations over the three years, 14, 17, and 19. This is a key site. It dominates Fife. It, Fife is a frontier zone where empires go up and down. But that peninsula, that peninsula status means that if you're in alliance with the people in Fife, you're controlling the Forth and the Tay, the two main waterways into the heart of Scotland. And I think that is a, 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 is a, is a, a proposition that people have yet to fully grasp the naval influence in Fife and, and the uh, encroachment of, and the influence of uh, ancient Rome. So that's, a, that's the previous excavations with Oliver. In 2021, following Oliver's passing, we wanted to build on Oliver's legacy. We agreed a collaboration effort, uh, agreement with Aberdeen University, which is where James and Gordon and others come in, to undertake investigations into East Lomond, East Lomond there, and its environs. Its environs might include Maiden Castle, described in Canmore as an unfinished Iron Age hill fort. I don't think so. We'll find out. We'll find out. Or we might look at some of these huge circular enclosures in the upland areas in the Lomond Hills, of which there are five, and which have never been investigated archaeologically. So there's plenty to do. We look forward to future work with James and the team. And I'm delighted now for James to come up and tell about the latest uh, work on East Lomond and how we're building on Oliver's legacy. So James Driscoll. Thanks, James. Oh, of course. Okay, so that's where the University of Aberdeen comes in. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was build on Ollie's work. So Ollie had a number of radiocarbon dates from the site that suggested the outer annex may have been built around the 2nd to 7th century AD, and occupation or activity within that dates a similar period. So the first thing we want to do is come along and comprehensively date this outer annex enclosure, and then in later years we hope to pop up to the upper citadel and all of these really well-preserved earthworks up here within the scheduled area. That is typically seen as a nuclear hill fort, which should date around the 7th to 9th century AD. So already we might have a, a broad chronological outline for the site where you have this big annex enclosure dating to this earlier period, which is built upon later um, during the 7th and 9th century. So in 2022, the first thing we did was place two trenches over this outer annex. And I'll quickly run through what we found. So um, we have a number of hearths from various different phases. We have other occupation features. Um, and more importantly, we have a nice stretch of this outer annex wall, um, as well as some interesting, unique features like this buttress here. So various different hearths, various different sizes and shapes. Um, the material from within them really suggests they're probably domestic in nature. We have um, possible features here that might be associated with uh, posts, um, which might suggest that surrounding the hearse, we have some sort of an earthen... Um... Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Is this mouse? Oh, this mouse, sorry. So um, we have these other features that could be associated with posts that were probably used to hold up some sort of a superstructure. And then we have the wall itself, the rampart wall, which although it survives, it didn't survive very well. We have a really poorly preserved um, facing here, an internal and external facing that survives to two courses high at best. Um, and we have some features within that, uh, things like um, bits of sharpening marks uh, and so on. The, the most important thing from the uh, outer annex wall in this trench was the possible buttress here. Um, if anyone's ever been to East Lomond on the southern side, you'll know that it drops off quite steeply. And this annex enclosure is placed right on top of that drop off and slope. So it's interesting that we have a buttress and it's interesting that it seems to be keyed in to the external face of the rampart itself, because that suggests that while they're building the fort, they realize we're on quite a steep slope we need to sort of um, figure out a way to keep this in check. Uh, so they build this buttress uh, as an original feature. Typically, these things are built after the fact, after the wall starts to slip and fall down. So the fact that we're finding it here in a, in a original context is quite um, significant because you don't tend to get these in um, Scottish hill forts. So the second trench um, is further to the east. And here we have slightly different features turning up. We have a much better preserved um, rampart wall. We have um, fewer hearths. We have possible internal occupation features like these, um, these post pads. And importantly, we have a lot more artifacts being recovered from this trench. So the one and only hearth we have, this tiny little guy here, um, actually produced some artifacts that suggest it was used in the metalworking process. We have this small uh, crucible mold, which is probably used for fine uh, metalworking. And then we have this stone weight up here. We have a variety of other different finds, um, things like iron fragments, iron waste, um, as well as some gaming pieces. We also have a few bits and pieces of um, features, post holes, stake holes that predate the construction of the rampart, but the majority of the artifacts uh, and layers abutting the wall seem to have been built after the wall was um, built or deposited after the wall was built. So the external wall itself was preserved to about four courses high in places. Um, outside of the wall face, we had a nice midden deposit. Underneath the wall, we also have a nice preserved floor layer. Um, underneath the wall core, we also have some large flagstones, which suggest, suggests it used as some sort of a solidifying base when the rampart's being built. Uh, and then on the inside of the wall, we have lots of deposits abutting that. So we have really, really good dating information that we can use to get some C14 dates. So um, the summer of 2023, with all of those really nice artifacts, with that really, really nice preserved stone wall, we decide let's put a much bigger trench right up against that, get more dating evidence for the wall and get a lot more nice artifacts. But typically archeology span being archeology, span we found very, very few artifacts and we found a really, really poorly preserved rampart wall. What we did find though was a lot of hearths. We have at least six hearths. Uh, we have possible post pads, and for the first time at East Lomond, we have the outline of a possible structure, um, a square or sub-rectangular structure. So the hearths, again, various different sizes and shapes, nothing in them, again, to suggest they're used in the metalworking process, probably domestic features. We have, um, in some of the uh, walls of the hearths, we have some knife sharpening marks uh, and other features. The most important thing from this trench really was identifying the shape and outline of this structure. So um, a, quite a large rectangular structure comprised of a single setting of stones. And those stones are probably used as the base for a sod wall. And that's why we're not getting any cut features. We're not getting a lot of post or stake holes associated with buildings because the structures themselves are actually not earth fast and they're being built with sod. 
And like we said, very few finds. We did have a gaming piece uh, and some spindle whorls and a couple of random bits of iron fragments as well dotted throughout the site. Um, and as we said, the outer rampart was really poorly preserved. Even though just over here, only a meter and a half away from this trench, we had that really nicely preserved four course high outer face to the stone wall itself. Now, when we look at the radiocarbon dating, um, this is East Lomond. We can see there's a nice detailed chronology, second to the middle or start of the 7th century AD. And that fits really well with some of the other sites that we have been excavating in the past couple of years, places like Tapanath, which we'll speak about uh, in a moment. But uh, Joe already mentioned um, comparisons for East Lomond. And the best comparison up until uh, the University of Aberdeen's excavations over the past couple of years was Trap Rain Law. Um, and Trap Rain Law, a very similar site. It has late Bronze Age phases, earlier phases, but the majority of the site seems to have been uh, mostly a, a Roman Iron Age uh, phasing or Roman Iron Age activity within the interior. That includes the construction of the massive 16 hectare Cruden wall, which probably dates to around the 5th century AD. We have lots and lots of Roman material as well as native material from the site. And just to give you an idea of the intensity of settlement at Trap Brain Law, um, curls, excavations in the early part of the 1900s um, over a smallish area of about 75 to uh, meters by 45 meters identified over 182 possible hearths. Um, just to give you an idea of the intensity and very similar things are probably happening at East Lomond in terms of the amount of hearths that we're coming across. Um, a huge huge amount of activity on the site but multi-phase activity. And key thing for Trap Rain Law is the clear link with the Roman world, leading some commentators to suggest that Trapper Law was actually a client kingdom or a client state of the Roman Empire. And we start to think, is East Lomond similar? There's some clear connection with Rome, um, but are they trading with them or are they in conflict with them? Beyond Trapper Law, we have a few hints of similar things happening throughout the rest of Northern Britain, places like Eildon Hill North in the Scottish borders, excavation here in the 1980s by Owen suggested that the hill fort was late Bronze Age. But um, if we look at the stray finds records and we actually look at the radiocarbon dates from Owen's excavations, it showcases really there's a significant late Roman Iron Age presence at the site, probably dating to the second to fourth century AD. And some of our more recent excavations at the site have produced a lot more late Bronze Age dates. And to confuse the matter further, underneath a lot of the layers that we dated to the late Bronze Age, we got a 5th, 6th century AD date. And that suggests that here we have a very, very important late Bronze Age site where we have a lot of settlement activity. And that's all been dug up, probably to build the bank of the hill fort. All of that late Bronze Age material was within the bank, but the actual hill fort itself may actually date to a much later period, probably the 5th, 6th century AD. And that brings us to our most recent set of extensive excavations at Taponath in Aberdeenshire, just to the north of us here. We've extensively mapped the site using LiDAR photogrammetry survey, uh, mapping out over 800 house platforms within this massive 16 and a half hectare hill fort. And we've done quite a bit of excavation within the interior. We've excavated nearly a dozen house sites and that has produced, again, very similar to Trap Rain Law in East Lomond, a significant number of hearths. Every single platform seems to have a hearth. Some platforms have multiple hearths. One of them even has a stack of five hearths placed one on top of the other. In terms of material culture, um, we have it all really from Taponath. We have native pottery, the first real um, identification of Pictish pottery found on mainland Scotland. We have Roman pottery, we have imported pottery, we have native pottery made to look like Roman imported pottery. We have um, fragments of moles, we have stone discs that are only found in funerary contexts prior to this. 
stone balls, glass beads. We even have a cobble with a crescent painted onto it. And very rarely do we find any animal bones at these kind of sites. We have horse teeth from the site and probably the most significant find to date, we have a possible Roman uh, tessera that may have been used in a mosaic floor. And if we compare the dates from Tap Tapanoth to East Lomond, you see something very similar happening. We have activity within the second to the seventh century AD, and we have really what seems to be two phases going on. We have 200 to 400, we have the initial settlement, and then that settlement peaks to a crescendo at the end of the 5th or 6th century AD. So it really seems that places like East Lomond, if we really dig hard into the literature, are just the tip of the iceberg. We have lots of other uh, large, densely populated hill forts on the edge, the peripheral area of the Roman Empire. We have places like the famous Yevering Bell, um, which overlooks the Anglo-Saxon Hall complex. Um, one season of excavation here by Hope Taylor um, before he uh, gave up on the excavation and lost the archive um, produced some 1st to 4th century AD material culture, things like Roman coins and imported pottery, uh, suggesting that the settlement here could again date to that late Roman Iron Age phase. And then we have other places, more exotic places like Wales, where we have the famous Fold Dry Garn, which has produced Iron Age and Romano-British uh, material culture that suggests occupation at that later time period. Garn Bodon, um, a large, densely populated hill fort with material that dates to the first 7th century AD. And then again, the very, very famous hill fort of Trey Carey, which um, in the early 20th century, an antiquarian dug 60 of these houses and produced uh, a huge gold mine of artifacts that date to around the 150, 400 AD. And then even further afield in places like Ireland. So again, we're looking at this peripheral region, the peripheral area of the Roman Empire. Um, we have possibilities for Comparanda here. Places like Brussel Town's Ring, which is probably associated with the famous Dunbolg Fort, mentioned in various different sagas around 520 AD, all the way up to the 9th, 10th century AD. It was a very important royal fortress, um, and even the kings of Leinster, the provincial kings of Ireland, would have resided in and around the area and used Dunbolg as their royal kaput at this early 500 AD time period. And here again, we have a huge cluster really dense populated hill fort of about 500 house sites within the interior. None of this excavated, but the historical sources might suggest that this, again, um, is a place of importance, a large, densely populated hill fort, possibly dating to this late Roman Iron Age, um, stretching into the early medieval period. So, to conclude quickly, we have... Um, uh, a very important hill fort on East Lomond. The excavation suggests that it dates to the 1st to 7th century AD, uh, but potentially that nuclear hill fort on the very tip within the scheduled area that no one's excavated yet might extend this chronology into the 7th to 9th century AD, which would be very unique. It would be one of the only possible densely populated hill forts in the area that stretches on beyond the 6th to 7th century AD. So very, very important in terms of elucidating, elucidating this um, possible new settlement horizon. We have intensive and sustained settlement activity at East Lomond, again paralleled at places like um, Trappering Law in East Lomond, access to Roman material and imported pottery, and importantly, access to important imported material after the Roman Empire seems to have collapsed. So they continue on as important places of um, uh, central places for trade. So um, to sum up, what I like to think is forget about the Romans. These sites um, are really helping us to revolutionize how we view the indigenous settlement of a period that's very often described as a dark age of Scottish archaeology.